super grateful that's uh to see so many people and to be connected with um with you all today and dennis um go ahead and uh, start with the introduction as well yeah my name is dennis Velasco. i'm an education coordinator for earth day network and i'm very happy to be joining you all this morning here and just talking about the thing we all love which is nature and sharing our experiences and getting ready for a wonderful panel uh, where we'll talk with Sean and Madhu and, and expand on our experiences and, as Yen mentioned, why it's so important to conserve this thing we all love, nature. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is we're going to have a video on. Um, so we'll go ahead, watch the video, and then uh, go on from there. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that video, Jose and Nature for All team. I feel like I just wanted to suggest that having that background, you know, during that, during this call would have been fantastic as well, like the birds and, and having that, um, you know, uh, vibe around would have been fantastic. Maybe for the next Nature for All <laughs> um, love fest. Um, anyway, thank you again for, for that video. Um, just wanted to formally welcome again. I feel like there's more people joining us in this call and uh, um, like what um, Pamela said, like there's a very nice quotes uh, at the end of the film. And also um, at the very start, I'm not sure if you saw the quote from uh, uh, Baba Guillaume about um, our love for nature. Like in the end, we will only conserve um, what we love. We'll love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught. And I feel like it's a it's a great um, quote step to follow during this this conversation. So, how are you feeling, Dennis? No, I'm, again, I'm very inspired by the video. I think it's great because it shows the diversity not only of people but of nature and the world. Um, and it really did, you know, uh, bring back some memories. Um, so, I'll, I'll I'll actually start off again by introducing myself again, Dennis Nolasco. Um, I'm an education coordinator at Earth Day Network. Um, 
And as Yen has mentioned, you know, we're here to celebrate our love of nature. And I just wanted to start off by sharing a quick story about uh, my own experiences with nature and my and how it, my love of nature has grown over the years. Um, so I grew up in an urban uh, DC, so I grew up surrounded by city. But I remember from a very young age uh, watching nature documentaries and just being fascinated um, by the images that I was seeing in just these faraway lands. Um, and just wanting to go out there and see all the animals and see all the different landscapes. Um, I was very fortunate that, um, you know, even though I grew up in the urban part of, of Washington, D.C., um, Shenandoah National Park uh, is about an hour, hour and a half drive from me and when I was growing up. And so my parents uh, would take me to the, uh, to the National Forest um, or to the National Park, and we would go hiking and explore. And I loved going into the river. And, you know, from a very young age, my parents... Um, helped me recognize the importance of nature and conserving it. You know, they would make sure that when I would take my water bottles in there, they'd say, you never, you never leave what you brought in. You got to make sure you take it, take it out. Um, so yeah, I, from a very young age, I grew up um, appreciating nature. Thanks to my parents. They're also uh, immigrants from El Salvador as well. Um, they grew up in the mountains and, um, you know, they would tell me stories of, of the beautiful mountains in El Salvador, volcanoes. I don't know if anybody here, has had a chance to go there, but it's a beautiful country. I actually just uh, was there about a week ago. And uh, it was what my parents would say to me about the beauty of the mountains and the volcanoes there. Uh, it didn't compare once I got there. It was just stunning. Um, so I highly recommend anybody who has a chance, go down to uh, El Salvador and check out the forest there. But yes, um, you know, this is all culminated in me coming to Earth Day, uh, where I wanted to share my love of nature and and encourage young people around the world to conserve its beauty. Um, so that's just a little bit about my story there, Yen. Um, have you been to El Salvador, Yen? <laughs> I haven't been, but based on your story, I'm now more motivated to go. So thank you. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's it's a, it's a beautiful it, like, country. High on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Um, yeah. But I'll pass it over to you, Yen, so you can introduce yourself again. Oh, thanks. Um, I think we have like somehow like similar stories. Um, so my name is Yen. I'm from the Philippines. And I think whenever I tell someone that I, I'm from the Philippines, everyone has like this uh, assumption that you have to know how to perfectly like to, how to swim because you're surrounded by waters or like you should immediately be in love with nature. And I think um, we're very fortunate, you know, to be surrounded by such beautiful nature in the Philippines. But actually for me, it didn't come naturally, unfortunately. Um, when I grew up, I was very sheltered. It was um, not like a common thing for us to go on hiking. I came from like a very non-touristy side of the Philippines. And there's like a lot of things to unfold there because I think um, when people say they love nature. There's like this specific image of like what to love about nature. It has to be very exotic. It has to be very different from what we were we're acquainted to. And for me, I I I started loving nature when I started to learn more about it and how important it to us and how we're so connected to it. And and I'm I'm I think the first real story that I I that got me involved in nature is when I participated in like a public hatchling of, of turtles that's really close to my place. And I didn't even know about it. And I think from there, like there's this like connection that you have to protect it. You have to, you know, you love it. So you have to do your best to do something for it. And I, somehow I have this feeling that that's what the, the nature for all is founded like on that knowledge that the more experience and connection that we have in nature, the more support and action there will be for nature conservation. And I think that's very timely right now as we, you know, face so many crises, especially for the biodiversity crisis. There's this delicate balance of our ecosystems at stake and it's high time that we take action. But, you know, also the question of like, why do we even need to do this? Like, why does our love for nature matter in this fight against for biodiversity crisis, against biodiversity crisis? So I think um, we're going to have such a, 
rich, you know, conversation today together with Sean and Madhu. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's quite late for Sean. I know Madhu, you know, you're joining the CMS COP at the moment. So thank you for take, making time for us today. And um, yeah, perhaps we could dive in, you know, with the, in the conversation. Okay. Fantastic. Um, but before we do, actually, perhaps we could also um, give our audience a little bit more information about the Nature for All movement and how we started and also like the background of um, IUCN and WCPA and so on and like the CEC and the Nature for All movement. So as you all know that um, this uh, Nature for All is under the IUCN and um, it's important um, for us to be connected with like the commissions as well that supports and um, and elevate the con the con uh, the conversation um, about uh, our love for nature and how we make policies about it. So, um, yeah. So Sean. Uh, so uh, Dennis, perhaps you could give us a backstory as well of of the commissions and such. Yeah, of course. Um, for those of you who know, the IUCN is one of the largest uh, environmental networks, and their goal is to promote the conservation of nature. Um, and through that, they've organized this Nature for All uh, Love Fest. Um, you know, this is a nice capstone that over the last couple of weeks, um, there have been 25 different partner events and activities um, where people are just sharing their love of nature and um, going out there and, and just making sure that uh, we're protecting what we love. Um, so it's been a wonderful event, and I'm just excited that um, we get to be a part of this as well. Um, Saying, having said that, uh, I would like to pass it on to Sean Southey there, and maybe he can tell us a little bit more about uh, Nature for All and, and then introduce himself. And also, Sean, if you don't mind, also sharing a story about your love mm -hmm. of nature and maybe a moment that inspired you. Well, thanks, Dennis and Yen, and hello, everyone. Um, it's wonderful for me to flick across these screens to see Fadi, who I saw six weeks ago at the COP, to see Pamela, who I saw a week ago in the mangroves of, of um, Ab uh, Addis Ababa, no, of um, Abu Dhabi. Terence, who I've worked with for 20 years, Luis and Sarah, Cheryl Vasante, Faras, Madhu. It's, there is a community that I can see in this group that are all of us connected through our relationship with nature. A lot of the work I do um, in my professional life is, is the campaign space, helping people think about what car they're gonna buy, what coffee they should buy, um, how do they challenge climate change? And we live in a world where we have a lot of problems and it's very complicated. And you could have a million campaigns going around you every moment to help you from the time you got up in the moment, morning, till the time you went to bed, helping you think through how to make sense of this complicated world. Or you could be in love with nature. And this is why I love nature for all, because it really gets at the root cause of why all of us are here. When we started doing this work, Karen and I and Cheryl and the, the WCPA and IUCN CEC family seven, eight years ago, it came out of a long lineage of looking at relationship with nature, values, the heartbeat of what we do. And we used to start many of our workshops, when did you fall in love with nature? when did you fall in love? And I probably now in my professional career heard a couple of thousand when you fell in love with nature stories. And they're remarkably touching, but there are also some real threads and similarities that run through that work. And it's about the intimacy of the moment, being with a trusted source, the relationship with space, going back to the same areas, it's about meaningful connection repeatedly with some place we love. And the reason it's so transformative is instead of changing one behavior, it helps change the way you think about many things, the way you vote, the way you shop, the way you raise your kids, the, 
the the jobs you take, the way you educate yourself. That's why I love this movement because if for the big shifts we have ahead of us, we're going to need to get deeper into our relationship with nature, our connection with nature. And the best way to do that is to experience its beauty and its wonder and its awe as often as possible. It started, Nature for All, as out of the two commissions at IUCN that are here. Madhu chairs the Commission on or Commission on Protected Areas, and I chair the Commission on Communication and Education. But now I'm super proud and excited that there's over 600 institutional partners who are members. It is housed loosely at IUCN, but it is not a legal entity. It cannot accept money. It doesn't have a bank account. We work as a community to leverage and lift stories of transformation that can be replicated by others. I would be remiss if I did not tell my love story. It's always complicated because I kind of fall in love every couple of weeks in a different way. Um, so I'm gonna share not when I fell in love, but my most recent truly awe-inspiring moment and that's when I spent three months this year in um, Saudi Arabia in a place called Alula, working on a protected area communication strategy for six protected areas, the almost the size of France. And there was no wildlife, very little wildlife, very little green. It's a desert environment. It was about 40 degrees when I was there, um, Celsius, um, super hot. But just incredibly intense landscapes and beautiful rock structures. And it made me realize that nature is not always the, the green that's behind me now. The, 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 my love of nature from when I played with frogs in ponds as a child is completely different for someone else whose love of nature who comes out of a desert environment. But they're equally robust and equally important. And it really reconnected me to that work. We at, um, in the the Nature for All sort of family, work on sort of a basic approach that you lift, you look to the community, you find what's working, you lift it up, you codify, share, and allow others who are in the similar space to take those ideas, adapt them, modify them, make them their own, and help connect their communities to going forward. So whether your grandmother's in Colombia taking your grandkids outside, whether you're at Parks Canada teaching new immigrants to park, whether you're Fadi taking people out to protected areas in Beirut and Lebanon, um, these are all different manifestations that can be borrowed, adopted. Um, some of the ones I really like is a new big focus we have working with a, a, a significant group of organizations such as the Salzburg Global Seminar, Alana Foundation, Children and Nature Network, looking at greening schoolyards and how transformational it is if children get to have education outside and if education goes right into or nature goes right into the curriculum and really uh, just I'd like to dream about a world where every child has a significant part of their educational experience outside and in nature. These love fests are lovely for me because they're a chance for us to share that love, but also as practitioners to share the thinking behind this work, the way we can elevate, the way we can support each other. Um, sometimes the environmental educator is seen as kind of that freaky person who works with kids inside a big organization and maybe they don't do as much as the policy people. But I think these are the people who are shifting the lives of the next generation that are going to change the way we, we look at the world. Jeet, good to see you always doing amazing work in India. I have not referenced everyone's name. Please forgive me. Um, I'll close just by saying this is a big year for IUCN. This is the year we convene sub-regionally in nine different um, regional conservation forums where we bring our members together and we talk and we strategize. And I really hope that any of you involved in that process will work with us to bring love into that space, love for nature into that space. Um, and really opening up 
our hearts to recognize the transformative relationship we can have with nature. So um, thank you so much. I'll stop there. All right. Thank you, Sean. That was, uh, no, I, I really. Sorry, I have to say nice dog, Pamela. I've never seen your dog before. <laughs> I love the no, thank you, Sean, for sharing that. And again, I, I love what you talked about, how a love for nature for everybody looks different, really depending on their experiences, their backgrounds. Um, but it's all equally the same. They're all just these these wonderful, beautiful experiences that we have to protect. Um, and I also love that you tied in the educational piece that um the environmental educators are the ones who are, are doing the transformative work. Um, fantastic. Um, I also wanted to introduce our other panelist, uh, Madhu. Um, and so Madhu, maybe you could do a similar as Sean, maybe you could uh, share your love of nature moment, um, as well as sharing a little bit about the WCPA. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis um, and Yen. It's 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 really exciting to be here and uh, a, a very happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Um, I, I just recognize that um, in my calendar, I saw this event and I said, oh, it must be Valentine's Day because it is um, Nature for All's uh, Love Fest. So it's I'm delighted to be here. And um, and as as I've been introduced already, I chair the World Commission on Protected Areas. Uh, we are a uh, commission of about a thousand members globally, uh, sorry, 3000 members globally. And um, we are mandated to provide um, technical scientific uh, policy advice on protected and conserved areas. And I'll come to that in a bit, but um, I think, you know, in terms of when was that moment, I think, you know, just like Sean says, it keeps happening all the time, but it does go back a very long time, I think, uh, because I, I do remember as, as, as a child, I spent more time outdoors, much to my uh, uh, mother's um, anxiety than indoors. Um, I grew up in a very urban setting in Southern India, but I was fortunate to have a little garden. So I spent most of my time there. But I think my first real experience in the in the sort in sort of nature, wild nature, uh, was when I visited a, a, a national park, uh, and it is a national park in southern India, and it was it was fantastic because we were taking a walk in the park, um, and and suddenly um, the 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 guide who was with us uh, told us to to stand still and to be quiet. Uh, because there was um, a, a, a male elephant, a tusker, a lone tusker about, uh, uh, you know, 20, 20 meters away. Um, and uh, obviously, we, we, it was a dry tropical forest. Um, and, you know, there was no clear visibility that which was good. But it was exciting uh, to be so close um, to, to wildlife. And we had to just, you know, respectfully uh, uh, retrace our steps and quietly walk away. But I think it was it was just the overall atmosphere, you know, the darkness. I think I we really miss darkness these days. Um, um, I think the darkness and the sounds of the forest at night uh, really really inspired me at that age. And and there's been no going back uh, since. Uh, you know, I've I've spent I've been very fortunate to spend some um, great um, times in 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 excellent uh, places full of nature. And, and I think um, I think a love for nature does come at any point in time. It doesn't have to be when you're young, but when it is, uh, when, you know, when you are young and you experience it, it sort of um, stays with you for life. But, but I think just bringing the conversation back to parks and protected areas, I think these are the places where people get to experience nature um, and, and really connect with nature. And I think they're really important, whether they be large spaces, um, uh, far from cities or uh, or uh, small protected areas and and parks within cities, I think they're equally important uh, for for that connection to nature that that humans uh, require. And I think this was so obvious during COVID. Um, you know, I, I I currently live in Singapore, which is a small city, but but all the parks got really packed. Uh, with people um, that they had to come up with some restrictions on uh, on allowing people to uh, to be there. Um, so in terms of um, WCPA, uh, we are 
technical, we are, you know, we produce a lot of scientific technical guidance, but we also advocate, we engage in, in advocacy for nature and we, we are specifically interested in, in, in uh, bringing in new constituencies to appreciate nature, especially youth. Uh, we have a, a, a young professional network and, and some really, really uh, fantastic and exciting young professionals are within the commission. And, and it's really good to see this kind of uh, excitement uh, with, with, the, uh, with the youth uh, for nature conservation. Um, and, and I think when we inspire love for nature, and, and as I said, protected areas are a good place to do that, we inspire um, uh, conservation action. I think without that, that initial appreciation of nature for its own sake, um, it's going to be very difficult for us to achieve conservation action. And as as um, Yen said, I'm I'm in Samarkand at the moment at the um, at at a big policy meeting of the Convention on Migratory Species, and it's truly heartening to see that you know governments do come to the table and talk about how how we're going to save migratory species, and and these governments are battling uh, a lot of different uh, priorities. Um, but I think um, it's 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 really essential for us to. Uh, to make peace with nature, which is the slogan for for a big policy meeting on biodiversity towards the end of the year, the, uh, the, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity. So I think there is widespread recognition of, of, of the need for us to, to appreciate nature um, and uh, to, fall, to keep falling uh, in love with it. I hope that uh, answered your question. Thank you so much, Madhu. Um, and, you know, thank you for giving us or sharing us your story um, of not only the first time you fell in love with nature, but like something that really um, that sticks to you. And I think um, that speaks for uh, or that resonates with a lot of our audience today. And I can see from the comments as well. Um, and I also like that uh, we we tack you tackled um, different um, aspect of protecting nature and falling in love with nature, and also it leads us to the policy aspect of it. And you said something about making peace with nature, and I think at the end of the day, that's something that um, we have to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, so thank you for sharing that story, Madhu. And I think now we'd like to move forward out to um, some of the questions for today. And I'm sure that there's a lot of burning questions as well from our audience and feel free to share with um, them with the, on our chat. Um, I think Dennis and I would like to um, make the most of our the opportunity as the hosts to uh, ask the questions to, to our panelists. So Dennis, would you like to um, give it a go and take the first question? Thank you. Um... So I just want to tap into a little bit of my background uh, when I prepare this phrase, this first question. Uh, as an educator, I taught um, I taught students in Los Angeles, and um, as I was there in 2020, and there was wildfires happening, uh, and so I thought I was very important, uh, especially as we were all distance learning, to educate my students about um, how these wildfires came about, how climate change is. is is affecting not only their hometown, but all of California. And I remember sharing this with my students and they were, they were, they were scared. But I remember as the, as the year got on and we returned back into the classroom, my students um, went from kind of gloom and doom and despair to asking, what can I do? What positive things can I do to help protect my home? And it was really a great moment for me because we were able to organize a beach cleanup and students came out and they had this wonderful experience where they went from despair to taking action and protecting what they love and what they know. Um, and so my question to both Madhu and Sean is, you know, in the face of climate change, it's important to have a positive and optimistic mindset. So what are your thoughts on, um, how we can make sure to stay in this positive mindset and how important it is um, to stay optimistic in light of everything that's happening. 
So first of all, I hope this is not just Madhu and I answering, um, because I think there's incredible wisdom around this whole room. So I will give us short answers on the hope that it that it prompts a, a dialogue with all of us. I mentioned that the nature for all comes out of a long lineage of thinking and practice across IUCN and its many members. Part of that work was the um, really driven by WCPA and youth engagement strategies around the um, protected areas meeting in Sydney and other places, a really deep commitment to youth. So a, a real sensitivity to thinking about what motivates a youth, young professionals, how do you get people involved? But it also comes out of a body of work in the Commission on Education and Communication that we call Love Not Loss. Love, not loss. And it was a pretty deep multi-year exploration of what motivates long-term behavior change. And if you look at the data now, the, the worrying, dire marketing of, of polar bears falling off of the last iceberg of uh, now these doom and gloom scenarios might prompt a, a small behavior Maybe you'll sign a petition, maybe you'll give $10, but they do not create the space inside you for extended long-term shift in culture and shift in caring for others and recognizing our space as nature. Um, and we've tried to embed that in, in nature for all. So you'll, almost all of the stories that are elevated are positive and engaging. Um, And I think it takes, this is where we need a community. We have experts inside this group who know what is the right entry point for a second year group of students on climate change. And it's probably not going into the hard science on climate change and the doom and gloom pieces. We have to tailor the messaging to the audience throughout their educational experience in the core curriculum piece and get them outside because the best learning is when you let nature be a teacher, when you let nature be a classroom, because then it's a much more holistic, engaging sense of, of learning. Over to you, Madhu. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of remaining positive uh, with all this, um, I think it's important to recognize that on the one hand, we do have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have the science and we've got to put it to use. Um, I, I think what's required at the moment, given biodiversity declines and uh, climate change is uh, a transformation uh, in, in, in our approach to, to conservation, to, to everything. Um, and I think we need to be changing the mindsets of not just conservationists, but, but everyone else uh, in, in other economic sectors. So I think there is um, there is reason for hope, and I can give you one example. So IUCN is a partner now with an initiative called Nature Positive, and and the Nature Positive initiative is is really um, a, an, a, a great example of how organizations are coming together and and saying we can do this, and this is how we're going to do it, uh, and really looking to. To transform, um, to transform actions in a way that by the end of uh, this decade, we are moving towards a nature positive future. So, so I see a lot of positive things happening, even though there, you know, there is the, the reality on the one side. And I think we should not lose uh, sight of, of, of the reality. Um, and I think uh, we have to draw on every uh, tool, and, uh, tool and guidance we have to, to address um, the, the change. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sean and Madhu. And yeah, I, I completely agree with both um, sentiments um, about staying away from the doom and gloom narrative um, because to have that transformative change, we need to have like the, the behavior into long-term and not just like a short-term fear and uh, having this anxiety that creates a little bit more problem later on. But, and I also agree with Madhu, like to not lose sight of reality that we do have the tools, we have the network and how are we going to maximize these opportunities 
um, to reach our goals. And I'm just wondering if the audience would like to share um, their thoughts as well, not only based on what Madhu and uh, Sean has al have already mentioned, but maybe um, you could also share your experience um, and answer the question. Hi, Pamela. Hi. Um, I've been listening. It's quite early here, by the way. So I was up at 5.30 a.m. Um, and um, very excited to casually, you know, reconnect with Sean. We had a fabulous time in Abu Dhabi in the mangroves. And this community is just amazing because the heartbeat is in the right place. And that's what I wanted to talk about. I think if we say reconnect with nature, I think it's reconciling with whom we are as a species. I mean, if you draw a parallel between all the availabilities we have at our fingertips, and yet a lot of kids are depressed, I think we have a problem. And the problem is exactly that we have to reconcile in our hearts and our minds what it is to be an ecosystem, all right? And that goes with every individual. What do we eat? How do we eat? How do we treat ourselves? How do we treat the others? How do we communicate? So it's really about re-examining lifestyles, I think. And that's why I have created the EcoHero program. It's about giving them the theory. How do ecosystem works? What's the role? What are the disruptors? And what we can do? Because it's not about them, they, the others. It's about us. It starts with us. Be a beacon in your community. Oh my gosh, Pamela, you're still pushing that eco card forward? I said, yeah because that's my only way of existing. And I think every job, every job, every person is both a producer and a consumer. You contribute something, hopefully of value to society. And if everything that we create had a positive value, the world would be a better place. It's really about looking in your heart what am I really contributing to society? Am I a joyful person or am I always negative? Well, chances are that if you're always negative, your life will be negative. Chances are when you do something good for nature, something good will come out of it. Just as Wangari Maathai, the first African Nobel Prize winner, prize winner for creating the Green Belt Movement, afforestation, putting tens of thousands of women to work. She said, you don't know what to do, plant a tree. You've done something positive. And while you're still figuring out why you're negative, at least something positive took over. Now do something twice as good, three times. And it's really about the art of doing good. And if you do good to nature, boy, nature will reward you. 10 times fold, but take the first step today, not tomorrow, not in a week, not as a promise. Take that step today. Experiment with what it feels like to put your fingers in the soil, to plant a seed and say, oop, it didn't work this time. What did I do wrong? Get excited about seeing that least. I have experiments in my entire house, second generation orchids, third gen, and it's like, ooh, what's next? Let me take care of my plants. And that should be in everybody's DNA. And it is in everybody's DNA, but brought to the surface through experiences and exchanges with positive people like us who believe in nature and who understand how nature is a part of their lives every single day. Wow. <laughs> it's like you didn't wake up super early. It's like you're really like... <laughs> all ready for this uh for this webinar thank you for sharing that and i guess like there's so many things that i want to um highlight from that speech uh, but i think that what resonates the most is um first there's no room for procrastination you have to do it today um and second is that uh becoming uh like starting uh with you like within yourself and and i think just want to build on that like it's important to operate within their sp our sphere of influence and becoming that ambassador. And like, it starts with you, your friends, your family, and then, you know, your network would grow. And like, how are you going to influence um, that uh, behavior or that mindset? And I think um, I have like a, a follow-up question actually for Shani Madu and of course for our audience um, related to that. So 
if we want to conserve what we love, we'll have to work together. And mm -hmm. I feel like there's a huge um, role that Nature for All plays in this. And we can draw inspiration from that. So uh, Madhu, Sean, you have immense experience in this field. What are some of the creative ways you've seen or maybe hope to see um, to be implemented to encourage community building? Do you want to start, Madhu, or you want me to jump in? You go first. So I, I'll speak to two things that that um, that the, the the movement has spawned, and we don't actually even know where they came from as ideas because the the community is so big. Um, the first is something we call the Nature for All Youth Oasis movement. And it was uh, something we started doing way back. And we just thought it would be great if youth had a space at a big conference for them to be together as a, as a launching pad, a, a place to collect themselves, to share their stories, not to be the whole time because it's not about putting youth in a box outside the meeting. So you equally need to mainstream youth into the meeting, but, this, this recognition that a space allowed community to, to develop and foster intergenerational dialogue to occur. And we did one of these and it worked. And then we did another and suddenly we'd done five or 10. Um, we did one and each of the three big parks congresses that uh, Madhu's amazing community manages, the Peru, um, Latin America and Caribbean protected area, the Asia protected area, the African protected area. And then we, we had this insight that there was a lesson and a learning over those 15 different um, youth oases. And so the youth themselves, Diana on the call, took a lead um, with Yose in, and um, Aaron, another uh, champion in the WCPA space, to write this up as a, as a methodology, an approach. How can you create these youth oasis type spaces in any meeting that you're holding? Local, sub-regional, national, global. What is best practice in sharing and giving ownership to to uh, meaningfully to youth voices. So for me, it's an interesting example of when you surface an innovation, often by happenstance, you learn from it, and then you, the real gift is codifying it and letting it go wild in nature, just like many things run wild in nature. The second, do you want to do one and then I'll do a third, Madhu, or shall I do both of mine back to back? Well, I could do one, um, I, so I can talk about how WCP is actually working with uh, partners uh, to expand the sounds of your park uh, project, uh, where we're enabling users to enjoy the acoustic beauty of the world's national parks and other protected areas. So, so I think, you know, there are creative ways of, of engaging uh, people um, and communities to, uh, to, to, to come together um, and, and um, and I think, as as um, Sean has said, we work. We we've been extremely successful in the youth uh, youth uh, youth oases in in the parks congresses, and we're planning to uh, continue to do that, especially at the upcoming Wild uh, Twelve Congress. Um, and we're very and I think Yen, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and we're very excited to be uh, hosting uh, a youth oasis uh, there as well. Over to you, Sean. So the, I mean, I, Yosei's, you must read Yosei's message in the chat because he speaks about this matching between a, a Bhutan group um, and one of the other partners. And I do think this incredible matchmaking that can happen when people spark on ideas and resonate across ecosystems and that weaving and, and merger of ideas. And he tells a beautiful story in the chat about Bhutan. Um, but another one that, that I like is, is when COVID hit us, we recognized it was quite hard to, uh, for parents, teachers, to suddenly try and figure out, I have my child 24-7, seven days a week for six months now, 
and they don't get out in nature don't anymore. Don't you have to be at a point in your life where you feel like you're hanging on by a thread to go and speak with a therapist? Because I often hear people think that therapy is reserved solely for those who have really struggled. Right um, a little segue there, um, but I'm back. <laughs> uh, so we we recognize that the answer to the problem that a teacher, a parent is is experiencing lies in the community already. So we created something called the Discovery Zone, an online repository of tools to help anyone engage anyone in nature. So if you want to read your child a comic book in mm -hmm. Hindi on water, you can search that. If you want an Arabic uh, le curriculum, you can search for that. It's a searchable database of over a thousand assets. And the piece that brings it together is love for nature because they are tools to help connect you and connect your community to nature. Simple again, not expensive, populated from the community. Um, so no one person went out and collected all thousand pieces. They are collected from you and we encourage each of you to continue to add to that mix and make it more robust and more useful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those answers. And I like the mix of, of ways to build the community. There's one with the youth oasis. It's, it's not just replicating, it's passing on knowledge and how to build this kind of community. And also the tools that you've mentioned, Shonda, are so helpful as well, like making it more um, uh, connected with nature, but also uh, more in like the technical, like in the technological way. So fantastic um, examples. And I think drawing from my experience as well, Madhu, um, I was a, I think I started with WCPA Young Professionals Network back in 2018. So it feels like a long time ago, but I still remember, I, I think, yeah, it was before my master's and I was still kind of um, insecure on like how I'm going to contribute. But having that kind of network to see and like showing you different ways to to participate in these events or in these uh, movement, it's it's also very helpful. So I'm quite quite grateful for WCPA Young Professionals Network um, that help us, you know, be exposed in in this field and and uh, help gain a, that you know that empowerment um, to be part of this movement and. Uh, yeah, I, maybe I could pass it on to uh, our audience if they would like to share something. You could also, you know, type it in the chat. Dennis, I'm sure you have a lot of experience as well or let a lot of insights uh, coming from Sean and Madhu's answers. I, I really did want to touch on a little bit about what Sean said about uh, the community building, especially during COVID. I mean, it was such a, when I was talking to my students and we were distance learning, um, the, the, lack of community uh, was something that really impacted them. And so having creating these spaces where students can go and then talk about the things that they care about, their love of nature and how they can make a positive influence. It's so important, especially in those, I mean, even more so now than ever. Um, and actually, I think it touches on my next question that I was gonna ask. And I know that Sean and Madhu mentioned youth a little bit, um, but I was going to say one of the nature for all priorities is bringing children into nature at a really young age, you know, encouraging them to take care of the things they love, conserving nature, wanting to protect it. Um, from Madhu and Sean, what are some ways that the IUCN and the commissions are doing to support and encourage this practice of bringing children in at a young age? Are there any specific projects that you can think of off the top of your head that have been successful in bringing in youth? to love nature, protect it, conserve it at a young age. I'm going to let Sean answer that because I think you can talk about your, your, your school project. Yeah. So again, there's multiple entry points and, and, you know, I mentioned this outdoor grandmothers group in Columbia where grandmothers recognized their grandkids were not um, understanding and, and appreciating nature. So they said, we'll take them outside. But before we do that, we better educate ourselves. So they did a deep, comprehensive analysis and understanding of their 
fauna, flora, they designed walks, materials, and then they started taking all their grandkids outside. It was so successful that um, in six months, all the grandfathers wanted to join, but they still call it Outdoor Grannies because it's an awesome name. Um, but for me, those there's many of those little projects which have huge replica replication potential. Um, but we really, in, in our community, we've really fallen in love with outdoor learning, um, with, with what we call nature-based education, which is bringing education back into nature and nature back into education. And, and they're very different, but they're very profound and very real. And it, it, it repositions nature as not just a place you go to, but a place you learn from, you engage with, that you are part of. Um, nature is the teacher. Nature is the classroom. Um, and it turns out that if you look around the world, there's an incredible number of children who do not have access to outdoor learning. And in a, in a world that now fetishizes science and math and technology and high grades, there's more and more pressure to not put children outside, to not invest in the schoolyard. You invest in the indoor classroom, but you build a, a square box outside with a semi-cement ground and a cookie cutter pair of, of, of swing set. And, and it turns out that doesn't actually help a child learn anywhere near as deeply. So in the spirit of not being the group that builds individual school grounds, we try to find what is the particular role that we as a movement supporting group can do. And it was recognizing that there's already beautiful examples of groups that are greening schoolyards and encouraging outdoor learning. So again, lifting those up and putting a spotlight on them. We were very lucky to work with the Children in Nature Network, a wonderful NGO out of the US, um, and four or five other groups, Alana Foundation, Salzburg, um, IUCN, CEC, WCPA, and others, and have got a half million dollar grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And for the first time ever, got to do a global survey on where is greening happening? and actually unpack examples, best practices, um, and, and the real uh, studies, the, the real evidence on what's funding this work. And some real amazing insights came out. A lot of the greening schoolyard work these days is funded out of climate money. So imagine that win-win where climate money greens a schoolyard, increases the education benefits, the health benefits, the socio-emotional learning, the engagement of the community, the deepness of the learning experience for the teacher and the student, and helps the, the global climate situation. Paris has now got 600 green oases underway, which act as cooling spaces for their communities. These are it's an example of an elegant entry point that gets the young kids involved. Um, Cause, and for me, there's really two, we talk about youth. There's two different audiences we have to think of. There's the young professionals who, who, who want to get into the space, who have skills, capacity, depth, and are probably already in love with nature already if they want to get into the space. And then there's the K to 12, where the learning experience will or will not guide them to become a, a young professional for the environment later. So do check out, there's a link in the chat. Um, do fill out the survey. If you have experience with green schoolyards, if you know someone that's done a green schoolyards work, we think it's a, a really beautiful and understandable way to shift the dial really fast. And again, I want to imagine a world by 2030 that every child has a green learning opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you for the answers. Um, before we um, give our thoughts as well and the answers that was given by Sean and Matt, uh, by Sean, uh, Madhu, I am just really curious. Um, maybe you could give us a little bit more information as well about the Young Professionals Network. And I know that Sean has already briefly mentioned it. And um, as a champion of youth as well, yourself, um, 
uh, I guess I'm curious what, what's next for the Young Professionals Network. Thanks, um, thanks, Yen. You know, as as uh, as you might know, but maybe the others don't. The WCPA's Young Professional Network is held together by one very very able young professional uh, in the form of Erin Drage, and I think um, you know working with Erin over the last two years um, in my role as chair of the commission has been really rewarding um, for me. And uh, so I think in terms of what next, I think maybe I think the first thing I want to say is. When Erin and I started thinking about the Young Professional uh, Network and how we were going to do uh, make it different from what it was, I think the first thing we discussed was the fact that we won't, we didn't want to to sort of separate the Young Professional Network from everything else that the commission was doing, and the commission, as I've said, you know, does highly, you know, sort of technical things, very, you know, very very um, complex stuff, um, and uh, sometimes. Uh, quite difficult for, for young professionals to sort of infiltrate these groups of people who are thinking about and writing about these things. So I think the way Erin and I worked on it was to, um, to really try and embed the young professionals in our specialist groups, into our task forces, um, and, and try to give young professionals an opportunity to just be this fly on the wall, trying to understand what's happening, to even help scheduling some of the calls amongst all these experts so that they get to understand the, you know, the, the state of play in terms of what's going on in policy, what's happening in global policy, or what's, you know, what's, what's being published on this topic in, in the scientific literature. So I really hope that's worked. And then the second thing we did was, um, was to appoint um, in our regions, I've got 12 uh, geographic regions uh, in the commission. So we appointed uh, a young professional focal points for each of the regions so that these young professional focal points in the regions could work with the regional vice chairs just to understand what, what uh, commission members were doing in the region and, um, and thus get a sense of what the commission does and, and um, you know, sort of immerse themselves in, in the work of the, of the commission. So I think we want to advance some of this. Um, I think we're interested in bringing in young professionals to, to help uh, with the youth strategy. You know, IUCN has a youth strategy and uh, I'm sure Sean will, will speak a lot about it. I think there's plenty to do for, for, for youth uh, within, within the IUCN uh, uh, realm. And, and I think within, the, uh, within WCPA per se, I'm really excited because I think my 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 world is you know I'm surrounded by young professionals and and I really am excited with working with them and um, and, and and thinking about many things differently. Um, so it's 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 exciting to 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 have more young professionals in in core areas of the, of work in the commission. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Madhu. And I feel like we got a glimpse of like from working with children and um, empowering them at a very young age into integrating uh, our young professionals in the commission, considering that it's such a large commission, right? It can be daunting. So having that kind of mentorship and guidance is, is crucial in this movement. What do you think, Dennis? No, of course, uh, bringing in the youth aspect. I mean, not only just like uh, we were talking about earlier, getting children in an entry point at a young age, and I love the information that Sean shared, but also encouraging the young professionals. It's almost like a pipeline. You create these green spaces when a child is very young, they go that love for nature. And then when they become a young professional, they care about the environment and they want to get involved in the environmental protection space. Um, so it is really creating that pipeline. And and I think it's it's great that, um, that we're seeing that happening. Um, uh, I'll pass it on to you, Yen, for the, for the next question as well. Thanks so much, Dennis. So I feel like now that we're delving into the ongoing initiatives and the future prospects, um, I want to further build on this foundation of our discussion right now and perhaps like shifting it, shifting our focus um, to the horizon. So for example, this year and next, um, going to be very significant for the IUCN. There's um, a myriad of plans to unfold leading up to um, the World Conservation Congress. So 
right now, it's not just about setting targets. It's about leveraging momentum gained since the last Congress and the Global Biodiversity Forum, where we had the Kunming, um, Montreal, um, GBF. And I suppose like the question is, um, how can the commissions, IUCN, civil society, all of us collectively propel this momentum forward? And how do we transform local efforts into a global force that inspires action for nature? That's a huge question. Um, so I will, and I think we should pass this one around a little because each of us have different slices of the answer. Diana chairs a, a group about to be created, a youth advisory committee um, for IUCN. It'd be fun for Diana to talk about that group's role. Um, this work is, IUC, so Madhu and I are volunteers. Commission members are all volunteers. We do this unpaid. It's probably the world's largest unfunded mandate you can possibly get. Um, but what it does is it brings together literally 17, 18,000 committed professionals who are doing this because they care. Some of them care about environmental law. Some of them care about um, um It's trying to tell me I switched language. Uh, I'm going to not, suddenly it says I'm speaking Spanish, which would be a unique moment uh, uh, experience for me. Um, so uh, law, ecosystem services, protected area, species, all of this is part of the, the this community. And my big insight, having been a chair now for seven or eight years, is you get out of it what you put into it. It's an incredible opportunity to help shift the world at scale. There is no bigger network. There is no group that that includes governments, civil society, um, indigenous peoples, local governments at this scale. And if it wasn't here, we'd have to invent it. It's not perfect, but it's as good as we have. And the more we each give into it, the, the more we'll succeed. And this is a particularly important year because this is when all the sub-regional meetings happen, where we begin to look at our successes in our program and how they can be stronger, where we begin to think of what resolutions does the world need to advance in a progressive way. So my biggest thing, encourage people to engage in that regional conservation process to the extent possible. If you happen to be a youth, connect to the youth in the commissions around you. Um, each commission, all seven, have a youth focal point or two focal points. Though they are there to, to help shepherd you, Sherpa you into this space and, and, to, um, and to find linkages into the community um, and plan to encourage us all to be a little bolder and think a little bigger. Thanks so much, Sean. I like that uh, we're bridging that grassroots to global efforts and and I think that's how we can collectively um move forward and having that linkage is is quite important and I think I just have like a very small follow-up question like what are you very excited about on top of the sub-regional groups and that we'll be discussing this year now that next year you know we have the World Conservation Congress I mean, I'm, I'm right now in love with nature-based education. I think IUCN has not worked a lot in the education space, the K-12 space. Many of our members have done incredible work in that space. If we really want to talk about culture change, shifting values, getting caring happening, getting that angst into action, it's about transforming the way the education praxis happens around the world. Not easy because it's so diverse. You know, you've got the U.S. with 52 states and how no, how many sub-millions of thousands of counties, each with their own curriculum, their own rules, their own guidance. You do that across 194 countries, uh, across billions of, of people. It's not easy. But if you want to transform, if we want to transform more attention on K-12 education and transforming the way that happens. 
We call it nature-based education. It could be, but that's not a substitute for environmental education or education for sustainable development. It's just a, a way to remind ourselves that nature is a big part of the learning experience. And I just wanted to touch on what Sean said there. I mean, that's exactly uh, the space that I operate in. And like Sean said, it's it's a huge undertaking in the U.S. to do this change across the world, but it is worthwhile. And obviously, what Sean was saying, they come in so many different names. At the end of the day, it all comes back to our love of nature, protecting it, and encouraging the youth, the young people of today to continue to do that. So it doesn't matter what you call it. At the end of the day, it's just loving nature. But Deb's comment is really important in the chat. There's so many people like Deb there who have experience in this space. And we will, Deb, be opening up this work on our, on our CEC community um, to help harvest and surface those insights from the people like you doing the real work on the front line and doing the links to the big groups like UNESCO. So in the next couple of weeks, months, there will be correspondence going out, think pieces, surveys, trying to, to galvanize and help this community. So Deb, we expect you to be in the middle of that. Here we go. We're delegating tasks. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I have a question uh, because, you know, I've, I've, I've known Sean and I'm also very close friends with another uh, IUCN, former IUCN person, Luc Bass, for years, gosh, maybe 15. And so I love IUCN. I work with them together, but I want to take it a step further. I'm a very bold person. That's why I moved from Belgium to America 25 years ago this year. Oh, my God, it's an anniversary because I wanted to make television about sustainability. I wanted to show already 25 years ago, hey, world, we have alternatives that are less harmful for the environment and for you. Let's look at sustainable lifestyle, just planting seeds. And now I think we got to go to action, right? Um, how can I further disseminate partnership for a major game that I've developed for all kids, okay? I mean, not all, um, more 13 to 18, and then taking a step higher. It's a race for the planet, all right? This is where I'm heading for my next two years. So how can IUCN become my strongest partner in this and, and reach all these kids? I can't disclose more because it's so exciting. I've been working on this for quite a while. How can I concretely move millions of kids and their parents to become eco heroes? How can we develop a partnership that would include TV, by the way, total communication and education blended? Sean. I'm, I'm going to gracefully curtail my engagement for the next 16 minutes because I really want to hear from the participants. Um, but, but, Anytime you have a particular bilateral like that, you just reach out to us, Pamela, anyone. We have a really robust community. We're super happy to do it. And of course, your work fits right in the middle of that nature-based education work because it is that is a multi-dimensional process of film art, et cetera. Um, so we're we're with okay. Deb, we expect to see both of you there. Great. Super. But I'm I really would love to hear more from others. So I think Madhu and I have spoken our fair share. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, uh, well, for our audience, if you also have um, more sentiments as well to share with us, with our host, uh, with our um, panelists, um, the Nature for All team, please either um, uh, raise your hands or perhaps write it in the chat. And, you know, while we're waiting for that, I guess uh, Shaw was able to delve into the the education part and also empowering more young people. Um, okay, we have another question. So I'll pause this for now and um, uh, I'll give it to you, um, Diana. Thank you, Yen. Make a little introduction of myself just because there is a, an extra special reason. Um, 
that many of you know, being the regional vice chair for Western Europe at IUCN Commission on Education and Communication. Another hat in the commission that I wear, uh, being a co-chair on youth and intergenerational partnerships. Hat that I continuously wear is being a coalition wild person. I think back in the days when I had a beautiful role of contributing to Global Youth Summit that was organized by IUCN, I was actually representing Coalition Wild. And having been on a steering committee of the organization, um, contributing to government, this whole experience of making to um, green career, because obviously not everyone's academic background, professional background um, in our community is connected directly to nature conservation. I'm an economist by education and an educator. And frankly, sometimes you really need more than anything else that system of support. For me, that really was Coalition Wild and participation in the roles that I had in the steering committee of the organization and also the membership in the commission. These two things probably empowered me the most to continue doing the things that I'm most passionate about. And um, what Dennis and Yen were posing, really these are the things that I would probably most want to ask all the youth on this call, but also colleagues to pay attention to those young people that you work with, if you're a young person yourself, this is the year when different communities across the globe in IUCN Big Family will be gathering. Regional conservation forums is in the first place, if you wish. And that is a place where youth should be present. And whether mm -hmm. you're a young person yourself going there, or you're a more senior colleague who may encourage a young person in your you know, professional environment to attend or support maybe that attendance, this is the time to make sure that those settings. And the regional conservation forums are such an important um, event. The series of events throughout the year really is because of these different communities, different stakeholders of a big environment conservation community meeting together on their work. You were talking earlier about how do we slice the elephant and how do we approach this big problem of like bringing different communities together, different stakeholders that speak different languages, technical, you know, um, act pocket, um, focus areas in terms of their work scope and so on. This is the moment of enabling those youth voices that represent very different communities to um, share best practices, to share on their work and to really put the spotlight on what the young professionals are contributing and ways in which they are engaged in a big message that I would really want to kindly ask all of us to reinforce in the areas where we're working on youth representation and elevation of youth work in the regional conservation forums leading to the cons um, Congress in Abu Dhabi in 2025. Thank you. Thanks so much, thank Diana. You. Thank, thank you, Diana. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I have a similar background where, uh, you know, my education is not in environmental con uh, conservation, but attending these seminars, attending these webinars, uh, getting involved with these organizations, groups has been a great way for me to become more informed and just uh, part of the community, which has been just so inviting as well. Uh, and so I just want to say I really enjoy being in these conversations and just being a part of it and 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 encouraging others to to join, as Diana was saying. Um, I did see also that Deb uh, had her hand up. So Deb, you're welcome to share your question or response. Yes, thank you so much for the conversation this morning. I really appreciate um, the connections folks are making um, and look forward to participating in some of the subgroups that um, have been named today. 
Um, I actually come in from the climate change learning um, and learning design sort of community um, and have been working pretty extensively across North America and globally in that effort for some time now. Um, anyway, I just really just wanted to share the love around appreciation for what is going on right now and the focus that um, Sean and others are making toward education and thinking with the extensive work that is being done in science and social sciences and in climate change learning, environmental sustainability work, and connecting that into the IUCN efforts for education. So thank you. Apparently, Sean, I'm speaking French. Je parle en français, mais pas pour me ce matin. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. It's the first time I've been told I'm speaking Spanish. So it's interesting that you were also speaking French. I don't know what language Dennis is speaking today. I, I'm here in Canada, so it's not wrong that <laughs> I can speak French, but um, no. So thank you very much for this morning. I feel like I'm also experiencing the same thing. Um, initially, it was Spanish, so I was with Sean and then now also in French. So <laughs> considering I'm also based, in, I mean, in a French-speaking um, place in Brussels, so that makes sense. <laughs> Um, thanks you so much, Deb. And I love the photo that Sean also sent. And hopefully that we're able to um, have like an archive of the chat. I feel like the conversation could have been like three hours and I, we would okay. still have not enough time to talk about our love of nature. Um, so I'm hoping that we could share the archive like later on and um, delve into the discussion further because I think that's you know, that's how we keep the movement alive, like keep the conversation going, keep the action going. So yeah, so thank you for sharing, Deb. Um, and it's really nice to to meet you. It's nice to meet everyone. Um, I feel like, yeah, those that one and a half hours was uh, were not enough for this. And I see Pamela agreeing with me. <laughs> um, but um, to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, I would like to first um, thank everyone for coming today. Madhu and Sean, thank you for sharing your insights. And it's great to not only understand what the Nature for All movement is, but to understand the background and how we started. And it's it's always nice to learn that, uh, that story, um, at least from what I gathered here. Um, we started by talking about love of nature and what I come to realize is that from, from what Pamela said as well, it's like um, reconciling with who we are as species. And I think by default, you know, as, as part of this ecosystem, as part of this planet, by default, we should love nature. That's our nature itself. And then comes to bring mind like what the nature versus nurture idea and the challenge now is not to only ignite that love of nature, but to nurture it and actually help us um, transform that individual sentiment into a shared global movement for conservation. So all the success stories that we've heard um, from community building to um, exploring you know, education um, movement and, and activities, um, it's like a, a blueprint for nurturing that aspect of our journey and that deliberate and collective efforts required to translate our love for nature into tangible results. I'm really grateful for learning about all these, um, you know, all these uh, activities and being part of this conversation as well. Thank you. It was such a lovely way to spend my afternoon right now. <laughs> and um, Dennis, uh, maybe you could also share your sentiments and what you've learned from our conversation. Yeah, no, just echoing what you said. Um, you know, I think this is a great grounding activity to talk about our love of nature, because like you said, it's it's our nature to love nature. I really love the way you said that. Uh, and just having everybody here remember why we're here, why we do the work that we do. Um, and it really is inspiring to hear everyone's stories and the work everybody's doing and the amazing plans that IUCN and all the different commissions have um, for the future as well. Um, I just wanted to add, you know, keep 
keep this sentiment of protecting nature, loving nature in your mind um, with all, a lot of upcoming events. I know that, you know, we have Earth Day coming up on April 22nd. So continue your love of nature and sign up for an Earth Day cleanup or an activity. Um, and also do share if you are going to do um, go out in nature today, make sure that you share the hashtag. You take a picture, share it online with the hashtag nature for all um, and make sure to tag uh, nature for all on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all your social medias. But it was it was a wonderful conversation. Definitely worth getting up early in the morning today to talk to just some amazing people. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy with how this turned out. And thank you, Sean. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you, Yen, for being an amazing co-host. Thanks so much, uh, Dennis.